So he gives a direct gift and then a command, right? He's saying, if you use this in this way, this is what will happen, right? Why does he do that? I would assume he would want his will to be done through them by the Spirit. Right. He wants us to know that this is coming not from Adam Thompson or Barry Caroline or anyone else who's in the office or even the HP apostles. He wants the church to know it's coming from him, right? Through those apostles, right? Um, what special authority has Christ given to his church on earth? So this is a question on page 315 in your catechism. So if you brought your catechism, you can follow on there. What special authority has Christ given to his church on earth? So God alone forgives sins through Christ Jesus. Christ has given to his church and only to his church, that is the whole redeemed people of God, the authority to forgive the sins of all who repent and to withhold his forgiveness from those who will not repent. So everything, therefore, in the, in the Christian church is ordered for, towards this goal. We shall daily receive in the church nothing but the forgiveness of sin through the word and signs to comfort and encourage our consciences as long as we live here. We got a couple of special references there, Matthew 18. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Our John 20 reference again there. Um, why do we call this? Uh, what, what's the special authority? We'll start it out with Apostle Paul. It's not a trick question. The keys. The keys, right? And the keys are the special authority given to the church to do what? Forgive sins and withhold the forgiveness of sins. And what's the what depends on that? Like what what causes one result for the other? Repentance, right? Um, so notice it doesn't specify like there's like seven special evil sins that this doesn't apply to, uh, or uh, the number of times. So like I'm sorry, you know, you know, you lied 18 times, and I'm only allowed to forgive 17 of them. So after this, you're done. Right. It doesn't say any of that stuff, right? It points out specifically the state of repentance because Jesus cares about your heart, right? Um, and so if you repent, I am like bound by God's word to forgive. So if anybody came in repentance to a pastor and confessed their sins and they withheld forgiveness, they don't have the authority to do that. They're in violation of the office that gives them that authority and they, they can't do that. So what does that effectively mean practically for that interaction? Is your forgiveness actually withheld or are you actually forgiven? You're actually forgiven, right? So what this power is not, this authority is not given to pastors to do with which they will. So if you're afraid that by, by ceding this ground to the office of the Holy Ministry that you're putting yourself at the mercy of a, of a fallible human being, that's not the case. If that fallible human being serving in that, that office, abuse it in either direction, it's no longer coming from God's authority. Right? So that means if he withholds the forgiveness against the word of God, then you would still be forgiven if you confess that to God. Right? And he's in the way of that. Right? And if he withholds forgiveness uh, when he shouldn't, he's also not doing that by his authority. And we have systems within the church to prevent that. Right? So let's say I start doing that. Um, or I've done that. What are the two? What are the two possibilities? If I do this incorrectly, what are the two possibilities? As for reasons why. One instance would be what? what? You could be removed from your office. Okay. Well, that's consequences. Yeah. I'm talking about like what could be a reason? What should, what should you first assume if the pastor does this incorrectly? That he's in, he made a mistake. Right. That he doesn't know that he's wrong. Okay. Because we're wrong sometimes. Okay. Do what? Well, maybe. Right? <laughs> um, so the first assumption isn't that he's malevolently using this authority for his own ends, right? But that is a possibility. It has been done, right? And so th those are the two basic explanations. If you see a pastor who's holding the office abusing this authority, it's either that he's doing it in ignorance, which then what does he need from, from the people of God he's serving? Well, one is forgiveness first, but, but, but teaching on rebuking and wow. trying to get them back on the right path. Right. So actually, before the forgiveness comes, the reproof, right? Because he doesn't yet know that he's done something wrong. And then, he, and then the you know 
what you would hope for, the reason you're doing that, is you say, Pastor, here, the Word of God says this. I think you're violating the Word of God. Right? And he says, oh, my goodness, you're right. And then he confesses that, and then we then you forget, right? Now, it can get messier than that, of course. Um, yeah, it's a beloved <clears throat> use of this authority. Uh, just as a matter of comfort for you, a reminder that if he's using it outside of the authority given, how much authority does he have? Zero. 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 He has none, right? Um, so I'm saying that so that you can be encouraged that if that happens to you, you know that it's not a binding word from the human off occupying the office. Because it essentially would be like a musical instrument trying to play without its player. It doesn't work. You can't do it. Right? So his words have no authority. Um, does that make sense? Kind of how that breaks down? Okay. Yeah. Sir. yeah. Like it said, you know, if you forgive anyone who sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Yeah. How does repent come in with? How do you know someone is repent? You just. Follow. So that's a great question. How do you know if somebody's repent? Well, like I cannot see into the hearts of people, nor can you. Only God can do that, right? So the ultimate judgment of this would be, would rest in his hand. But what he's given his church to do, he says, according to my word, right, all that I have taught you, I'm going to set up this way through the church. Primarily, I think the goal is for the forgiveness of sin, so that you can trust when the pastor says it, it's not just some random dude saying this to you on his own authority. Like, no, I think, I think you're good. I think you are contrite. It's really coming from Jesus himself, so you can believe it. But also in this case, with you withholding the forgiveness, that has to be done in accordance with the word of God, right? And you would do that, really that's only done publicly in the church if it's a public unrepentant thing. So let's say Ron opened a brothel down the street. Okay. And it's open nine to five. <laughs> So say that you, you remember our church and you did that, and I found out about it, and I would probably tell my elders, hey, I've, I've, I've discovered this thing about one of our members, I'm going to go admonish him one-on-one -on -one to cease that, to turn away from that, and repent, right? And if he does that, if, if Ron says, oh, I didn't know that this was bad, I'm going to turn this down, and I'm going to repent of that, I'll say that, right? But if you say, who are you to tell me what to do? I This is how I'm making a living. You justify it. Whatever way you justify it, you keep doing it. Then I would say, okay, well, then as long as you do that, you will not receive the Lord's Supper here, and you are not in communion with the body of Christ here. Not because we don't want you to, but because you have separated yourself okay, by rejecting his will and his word. I guess I was just okay. getting a confused with, we all sin. Yeah. And you know, we could Giving us of sins, and the next day we go and do the same thing. Correct. So repentance isn't that you turn away and never sin again. Repentance is a godly sorrow over what you've done. Right. So it isn't that. Uh, that's why it is. That's why it's hinged on the repentance piece and not on anything else. Right. Because if if it wasn't, we'd all be in big trouble for the reason you you described. Um, so yeah. So great question. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, if there was a openly homosexual couple that wanted to come to church, they wouldn't be allowed to come to church. Then, that kind okay, of no, so, <laughs> yes, so this is not, what this does not do is it doesn't bar you from the assembly. It doesn't bar you from coming and hearing God's word. In fact, we want you to come and hear God's word, right? Um, so, like, one of, uh, one of the pastors a little older than me, he was a vicar at our home church when I was in high school. He's a pastor out in Oregon, and they have a, a big gay pride uh, parade that goes by their church, and they always set up a table and offer their information and available for any questions. And he often has very hostile exchanges with them when people come up because they assume that he's going to tell them he doesn't want anything to do with them. And he said, and one guy he said pretty much me and said, "Well, what would you do if I showed up in your church on Sunday?" He said, "I, I would thank God because that's right where I want you to be." Right. right? So what this is not talking about is the ability to hear God's word. Right? We don't want to get in the way of that at all. Right? That's, in fact, precisely what we're trying to get them to do, is to listen to God. Right? So what this is saying is that you're barred from the things that belong to the believing member. 
So we believe that you aren't to take communion if you're in a state of unrepentance because you're eating and drinking the judgment of the body and blood on yourself. We don't want that. It doesn't, I don't know exactly what all that means, but it doesn't sound great. And so when it says that in 1 Corinthians 11, we say, for your own well-being during this time of unrepentance, you're not gonna, and even if it gets to the point of excommunication, you still don't bar them from attending and hearing God's word. You want them to attend and hear God's word. Is that answer? Oh, yeah, it just kind of explains like the level. So. Yeah, 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 because yeah, so we'll, we'll kind of get into this a little bit. Um, well, actually, let's, let's just keep going. Um, okay, who is to be forgiven? Yep, all those who repent and ask for forgiveness. Their sins are to be absolved, right? Um, so Acts 3.19, repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And Psalm 32.5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Right? So anyone who repents is to be forgiven. Uh, who is not to be forgiven? The under It's that simple. Now, the situations that you're involved in, that may be messy, but that's kind of the guiding post. By the way, this is also your guide. Um, you're not exercising this authority through the church publicly, but you are private. Right? So if somebody sins against you, this is also your guidepost for forgiving them. If they come to you in, in repentance, whether you want to or not, you are to forgive them. Right? And the reality of forgiveness as demonstrated by the way Christ gives us the church here, is a reality outside of your control. Okay, so, so some people will say, what if I'm not ready to forgive? Uh, Jesus says, get ready. <laughs> if somebody comes to you in repentance, you are to forgive them. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that you're forgetting about the hurt they caused you and then you're pretending it didn't happen. But you are not to withhold that forgiveness from them. Nor does it mean that your interaction is done. You may need to, you may need to say, you know, I forgive you, but I want to process this with you and talk about it. That's fine. That, that would be good. But you don't want to withhold forgiveness, right? And the thing that always pops into my mind is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Because if any time another human withholds forgiveness from another human, that is what you are. You are the unforgiving servant who is choking some dude out, throwing them in jail for 100 bucks after you just got forgiven the debt of like 15 years. So this is the same. This is the same guiding principle for that as well. Right? And when you're withholding forgiveness for somebody who's unrepentant, even in your private relationships, who are you doing that for? No, you're doing it for them, right? The only reason that you withhold forgiveness is because you want them to understand that they are doing something that is un not pleasing to God, right? It doesn't matter. It, you know, in a certain sense, it doesn't matter whether you like it, whether God says it's good or not. Right? And so the orientation of your forgiveness and your withholding is the desire that they are forgiven, that they come to know that what they did is something they need to do. Right? Now, that's really difficult at times. Some people don't want to acknowledge that, or they may have to disagree with you. And that kind of thing. But that's sort of the basic uh, guy I'm saying. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah, can you? Yeah. Say, okay, so you're saying if somebody doesn't repent about something they did to you, you don't have to forgive them. Uh, no, not only you don't have to, you shouldn't. Okay. Because you would be giving them a word of God you do not have the authority to give in their current spiritual well, state. Like, what about, like, in, in your heart, though, you, like, doesn't God want us to forgive people, whether they... So that's that's a that's a great question. So uh, part of what I meant by forgiveness is something that is outside of you. Is what forgiveness isn't is you reconciling to them in your heart. That's not forgiveness, right? Uh, because they don't even know. Right. Right. Okay. So, so forgiveness the is the communication of reconciliation in the authority of the Spirit. That's forgiveness. So if if you wronged somebody, would you, would you, if somebody wronged you and you met them five years later and you're still upset, they say, oh, well, I forgave, I, I apologized to you in my heart four years ago. 
And you say, well, that's not really an apology. <laughs> so it's not an internal forgiveness and, and apologies are not internal things. Now they are internal if it's between you and God. Right? So that's what happens on Sunday morning when we have that period of silence is you're, you're thinking of some particular things that are on your mind and you're, you're putting those at the foot of the cross. Right? That's right. But between you and another human being, forgiveness is, is an exchange that is spoken and received. And if the speaking and the receiving doesn't happen, then it doesn't occur. Right? That's precisely the reason why you're not supposed to hold on to these things for very long. Because you never know what's going to happen. Right? Uh, and so you want to resolve those things as quickly as possible. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't find some measure of peace in yourself if you've decided that, like, you know what, this person was in a tough situation. I'm not going to take this personally. And I am very willing to forgive them should they approach me about that. And even maybe at some point urging them to do so, it's been a long time. But without the exchange with them, the forgiveness doesn't happen. Because right? in, in, a, in, a, in the same way that I can't pronounce forgiveness for an unrepentant sinner, neither can you. Right? Then, you're, then you, in the same way, you've stepped out of the authority that God has given his church through Jesus. And you're saying something he doesn't say. Right? Because in John 20, we read today, what does he say? He says that if you forgive them, they are forgiven if it's withheld, and it's not forgiven, and it should be withheld for those who do not repent. <clears throat> yeah. It was just splitting hair. Yeah. Uh, what about from the salvation standpoint? If that person does ask for forgiveness and is repentant to the Lord, but they don't go back to the person who they committed the transgression against. I don't know if I can authoritatively answer that one. I, I would I would err on the side of saying yes, but my follow-up question would be then why wouldn't I? Um, so like if they're on their deathbed and they don't have an opportunity to talk to the specific person, but they ask forgiveness for it. Uh, I mean, your forgiveness, sorry to break it to you, Dave, isn't what saves people, right? It's Christ. So like I think in the in the case of salvation, um, that would that would be. I think the, the worry is when you don't do that with a lot of people, then you're no longer sort of bearing the spirit of Christ. You're bearing the spirit of like retribution and vengeance and grudges. And, and I've I've had experience with people, even with one of those, that they hold on to, and it usually doesn't remain just in that one thing. A lot of stuff develops over time. All right, Jim, you're next. I just like I like the application of this outside of the church because that's where I think it really plays out because we're all willing participants. So for the most part, if somebody offends or hurts somebody else's feelings, here, we're going to work it out 99% of the time. But outside of this realm, when we're dealing with people that don't play by the same rules as us, particularly, that's what comes into play. So what does forgiveness look like, especially when you're dealing with somebody that you have to, you're still going to have to be around them even after an act is done or something is said, sure. and, you know, you're going to have to be, you know, whether it's on the job or in the neighborhood yep. or you know, whatever. What does, what's that supposed to look like? How does that, how does that happen? For yeah. So the question is, uh, what, is, what does forgiveness look like outside of the context of the believing community, right? That's your question. Uh, it's the same, actually. It looks the same. So if you've wronged somebody, you are to confess that wrong to them and ask for their forgiveness. All right. All right. And, if, and if they wrong you, right. And they come to you and, and apologize about that. You are to forgive them. And, and as a member of the church, because we you've received the Holy Spirit, you're not just speaking on behalf of the forgiveness that they owe you, but that they're forgiven in the sight of God for that particular. But I'd be more in the terms of like how they are not going to be repentant, but you still have to be around them. You still have to sure. deal with them. What is that supposed to look like? I think. Um, that that looks like you know, like if you're in the know about something and somebody else isn't, then you have knowledge about why they're motivated to do that. So we've been taught as Christians that our enemies are not of flesh and blood. They're of the, the principalities and powers of darkness that play in the world. And so that allows us, even with unbelievers, to say, you know, while this person hurt me, I know it wasn't really them. They're not my enemy, really. Right. Father, forgive them. They know it's not what they do. Right. right. So we're we're forgiving them, even though they haven't asked for it. In some no, sense, that's right? not you forgiving them. If you say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, you're <laughs> imploring him 
to forgive them. Because, again, you don't have the authority to forgive an unrepentant sinner. Nor do I. Right? Because I can't speak on behalf of God that somebody's in a state of unrepentance because he hasn't given me the authority to do so. The only thing he told me to do is not forgive them so that through that, that not forgiving, they repent and confess and then I joyfully forgive. I just kind of feel like from experience that I kind of got to bring somebody along sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like sure. say, look, man, you know, like I, you don't return hate to hate. You kind of like you give them the light. You sure. Know, well, let's like, let's be clear about a couple things here. When you're withholding forgiveness, you're not hating someone. The world will say you are, but the Bible says that that is what you are to do to love them, because you're desiring that they turn away from the thing which they're doing. If you affirm the thing they're doing, you are affirming them walking in a path of destruction that leads away from Jesus, and by Christian definition, that's the opposite of love. Right. So, so we have to make sure we understand. Where we're getting our definition of loving action from the world or, or the scriptures, because in this particular case, especially, it's very different. Now, to the point you're making, I agree. Like what we're talking about right now in the hypothetical is just the instance of forgiveness of sins and repentance. But that's likely not the entirety of your relationship with the person you're speaking to, right? So you may not have the authority to forgive that particular sin that caused hurt between you and the person. But what do you have authority to? You do have the authority to. Tell them about Jesus, to encourage them, to love them, right? And to, through that, encourage them to turn away from the very thing which caused the hurt between you in the first place, okay. right? But what, what I'm saying is that the particular act of forgiving that sin is not your authority, it's not within your given authority from Jesus to do if they are unrepentant about it. But that doesn't mean you can't do all that other stuff. So practically speaking, it, it is not, uh, well, this next question will kind of answer, I think, some of what you're concerned about. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, enjoy the, I enjoy the word picture from Romans 12, right? If your enemy is hungry, feed them, right? If yeah, you're thirsty, yeah. give them something to drink, and in doing so, you'll be heaping burning coals. On you them. Yeah, but of course, I'm passing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, but that's a, that's a great point. It's like, how am I supposed to, as a believer, how am I supposed to treat somebody who treats them like crap? Treat them like gold. Yeah. yeah. Forgive them, love them, cherish them, do good for them. And that is, and that's just the default. That's right. And so if somebody treats you poorly, that doesn't change. Now I'm going to send them a thank you card. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pete. On, on what Gabe was saying, um, as soon as he said it, I immediately um, thought of David, Uriah, and Jeva. And, and his words were, to you, Lord, to you alone, I have sinned. Now, of course, he couldn't go back to Uriah. He was already dead. Right. But it doesn't say anything about him going to Bathsheba. But also in the New Testament, it says, if you have enmity to your brother in your heart when you were at the table, leave. Go make amends with your brother and then come back. Right. So I, I, I think it comes down to situational. If you can't make amends with your brother, do it. Um, yes. And if you can't, then, you, of course, you're going to be making amends with the Lord because... All of our sin, first and foremost, is against the Lord. Right. Well, and I think first and foremost, this authority was given for the relief of sin. That's what it's for. It's not primarily for the withholding of forgiveness. The withholding of forgiveness part of this is meant to be a temporary thing to prompt the forgiveness part. Right. So if we look at question four here, what is excommunication? Matthew 18, 15 to 18. We're all pretty familiar with that process, right? Uh, that is outlined there. But what it says at the end of that, so in 18 verse 17, it says, if he refuses to listen to them, so this is even if uh, you brought witnesses along with you, um, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. So to Jim's clarification earlier, what is who is this is referring to action between believers, right? So this is if your believing brother or sister has wronged, has sinned, and you are to go to them because your desire is that they turn away from that and are forgiven, right? And, and this situation is they've ignored you, they've ignored you plus witnesses, and they've ignored the church as a whole, right? So it's kind of getting to Ron's question. So what are you to do? You are to let them be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What does that mean? Outside the assembly. Outside the assembly. That's part one. What else does it mean? 
And if you want to know, how does Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? He eats, he eats with them. And what does he do? What does he talk with them about? Yeah, him. What he came to do, right? So what excommunication does not mean is that they're shunned and no one talks to them. Okay? I think that's sort of the general perception that people have. And historically, the church has malpracticed in that way, so it's not without basis. But what this means is that they are barred from the gifts meant for those who believe, but that is, that's strictly the forgiveness of sins pronounced through the church and the sacraments. Everything else, specifically the word of God, is something still meant for them, because that's why Jesus met with them in the first place, was to give them that word, right? And so the only thing that's being said here isn't like shun them and don't speak to them. It's now you speak to them as if they do not believe in Jesus. Formerly, you were speaking to them as if they did. Now you are speaking to them as if they don't. And so how do you speak to somebody who you know doesn't believe in Jesus? You tell them about it. You tell them about Jesus. You love them. You forgive them when you're able. You treat them well even when they treat you poorly. Right? All of those things. Because all of those things bear witness to the truth which they reject. Right? Now, in the midst of that, you withhold forgiving them. And you withhold them from coming to the table. Because they've rejected the confession that binds that group. Right? They, they're no longer part of the one cup and the one bread because they've removed themselves from that because they're unrepentant. Right? Um, but you certainly don't bar them from coming to your church and hearing the word, and you don't stop having dinners with them and talking to them. Instead, maybe you seek them out more if they'll have you, right? And maybe you're not the right person. Maybe you're the one that's caused part of the problem that maybe you ask somebody else from your congregation to do that. That's what I would do in some cases if it was a, if there was a situation where they wouldn't be able to hear it well for me, I would send one of the elders to my staff. Um, keeping in mind all the time the goal of this is that they repent, they confess, they repent, they're forgiven, and they are welcomed back to the table. We want everybody at the table. We want to be in one, we want to be receiving the one cup and that one bread in the one same spirit with everyone. Right? Uh, so that's the goal of all this. Yeah. Right. Uh, I always thought if you were at the community, you were just kicked out and had to be by yourself. You couldn't go to church, right? No, you can go to church, but what, what you're being excommunicated from is the body of believers, okay. which is the invisible unity of the church. Right? So that just means that things reserved for members are no longer yours because you're no longer you have removed yourself. And so the church is, in a way, excommunication is the church finally acknowledging your wish, in a way. Um, Lewis had this, he said, he said this about the gates of hell, too, that um, for those who get into heaven, it's because thy will has been done. And for those who go to hell, they are closing the door from the inside because God is saying to them, thy will be done. Right? Because they have chosen that for themselves. They have rejected all of his attempts to reach them. Uh, and so in this process, it's similar. The church is reaching out as Christ, and we want to forgive. We want them to repent and return. We want them to be at the table with us. And at each stage, they have turned us down. So the, the final stage is acknowledging, okay, they're no longer a part of us by their own desire. Uh, never, never fun. Fortunately, it doesn't happen very often, uh, but it's it's one of the things given the church. Okay. Any other questions about that? Okay. Um, so we, we kind of covered these next three questions under four there. Um, so it isn't that the congregation then pretends they don't exist and gives them silent treatment, right? They reach out to them, they preach Jesus to them, they express their love and desire for them to return to be a part of the body of Christ in that place until, Lord willing, they do. And then we, along with heaven, rejoice. Okay, question number five. How does the church publicly exercise the office of the keys?
Uh, for those with your catechism, it's the bottom of page 318, question 343. How does the church publicly exercise the office of the keys? Christ has instituted the pastoral office through which the office of the keys is exercised publicly, that is, on behalf of the church. The Christian congregation, acting in accordance with the will of Christ, calls qualified men to serve as his ministers, forgiving and retaining sins according to his command. So, um, to illustrate that, I have I have the right here for ordination into a holy ministry. Uh, and here is the exchange where that happens. Yeah. So this is being spoken to the candidate who is up for ordination. And this and they have to answer in the affirmative to this question. Will you faithfully instruct both young and old in the chief articles of the Christian doctrine? Will you forgive the sins of those who repent? And will you promise never to divulge the sins confessed to you? Will you minister faithfully to the sick and dying? And will you demonstrate to the church a constant and ready ministry entered in the gospel? Will you admonish and encourage the people to live a li to a lively confidence in Christ and the Holy Spirit? Um, and then the one prior to that. Do you promise that you'll perform the duties of your office in accordance with these confessions that all your preaching and teaching and your administration of the sacraments will be in conformity with Holy Scripture? And with these confessions, right? So the way that the church at large, sort of with in, in accordance with God's direction, enacts this authority is by calling someone to a particular office to carry out that authority <coughs> on behalf of the church. So how many of you understand why uh, a lot of times I'm faced away from you during the service? Do you know why I do that? I'm talking to God, just me and him? No. <laughs> On behalf of the congregation, right? So I'm your mouthpiece. So when we do the prayer of the church, it's called the prayer of the church, even though I'm the only one saying it, because in my office, I'm speaking that prayer on behalf of the congregation. So that's why I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to God. And that's why you affirm the prayer at the end by saying, Lord, in your mercy. Um, so this is a similar thing that you have called me to enact this authority on behalf of you, the church. Now, that's why it's important that I am bound, that authority is not bound to me. It's bound to what? Church. Well, more specifically, the office within the church where this is carried out, right? So that means if I violate that authority, it doesn't remain with me, right? I'm gone and it remains in the office and someone new takes it up. Um, and so that's where you can rest at ease. Not only is it in the sight of God, your sins are not withheld if the pastor is doing that not in accordance with God's word, but he also, unless he repents and turns away from that behavior, will not be your pastor for very long because he's violating the given authority of the office he occupies. Okay. So in, in, a, in our elders meeting, we're reading a book, and at the beginning, it makes this really helpful distinction between power and authority. Power is something grasped and taken, and authority is something handed out and given. So whenever the pastor is working within his own power, he's grasping for something that was not given to him, and therefore he has no authority to speak in that way or do that thing. And in those moments, even any member of the church, even a 10-year-old, can come and say, Pastor, the Bible says this, and you're doing that. You should stop doing it. And then he should. Because just like the 10-year-old, the pastor is still bound by the authority of the same word. And if he's not working within that authority, he has none. And you should not listen to him. Does that make sense? All right. I just wanted to set you at ease about that and kind of make sense of it is given to the church, and the church has given it to be exercised publicly through this office that they call. Okay. Why is it called the office of the keys? So the office of the keys, the phrase comes from Matthew 16, verse 19. Um, and Jesus refers to it that I give you the keys of the kingdom. Um, and that's where the phrase comes from, because you're binding and loosing, so it's like locking and unlocking. So that's why where the name comes from. <clears throat> Good question. But it says here that, that we don't have authority to forgive sin, only you do. Is that right? Close. There's a there's a distinction there. Uh, you do not have the authority to do the public 
exercise of the office of the keys in the context of the church. In the church. So not anyone can go up. So there's even rights when we do a service, like let's say the elders are doing it instead of an ordained pastor, they actually cannot proclaim the forgiveness of sins. They do a declaration of grace, which is a different thing. They say, they point you to the forgiveness you have in Christ, but they cannot say instead of by the command of my Lord Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Because the congregation, the church in that place did not give them the authority to do so by calling them to that office. Okay. Um, so it would be wrong of me to delegate that to somebody else because I would be abdicating the thing that you called me specifically to do. And it would be wrong of somebody to try and grasp that power outside of the authority given and do those. But you, as the church, have been given the authority to forgive sins, not only here on earth, but in, in the eyes of God, in your in your interactions first. When you say publicly, you mean within church, and then right. also publicly outside the church. Right. Okay. Well, publicly in the sense that it's between you and another person, yeah. but you don't have the authority to like assemble 200 people and pronounce the forgiveness of sins. Right. Um, and there's, there's a reason that that happens in the context of church as well. Uh, because you want it to be happening in the context of people hearing and learning about Christ. And the, the, a lot of the goal of the service is to bring about that sense of contrition and repentance. So there's usually an element of the sermon that's law-oriented, that, that reveals your own sin to you so that you can then turn away from it and confess. And there's always an element that talks about because of that, because of what Christ has done, that sin is forgiven. So when, I, when I've forgiven people in the past, it's usually my personal forgiveness. Is there something else that I should be saying? No, so when you give your personal forgiveness, you're absolving them of their sin against you, not just in your own words, but before God. So how does that, how do you pronounce that? You just say, I forgive you. Okay, cool. I've been doing it right. Yeah, you've been doing it right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the difference between like, if, there, if there's a... If there's a Christian, if there's two non-Christians and they have that exchange and one forgives the other, they have not, because they're not a part of the believing body of Jesus, they can't speak on behalf of Jesus with regards to that. Because there's two things that are happening when you sin against another human being. You've sinned against them, right, specifically, but you've also sinned against God because you violated his will for you and creation. Right? And so when you speak forgiveness as a believer, you are pronouncing forgiveness in this particular instance, for both. I just want to apologize. Don't talk too much. Oh, no, no, no. Those are good application questions. Application of this out in the real world is where it's most valuable. Yeah, yeah. But you do want to, I would still say, you do want to encourage them to gather with the believer. So you'll notice in the text for the gospel reading today, Jesus didn't appear to um, Thomas on the road somewhere. Where did he appear to him? That yeah, eight days later, a week, a new created week, eight days later, the disciples gathered again, and Thomas was with them. Right? So Jesus has promised to come to us and meet us, but not everywhere. Right? He set up his church so that you knew where to find him. Right? So somebody, I saw a meme somebody posted, um, I think yesterday, where it talks about Jesus promising to be found, and then it had an arrow pointing to a picture of the Bible. Picture of a baptismal font and a picture of the Lord's Son. Because he's promised to be there for you in all of those places. Now, he can, in his divine providence and power, come to you anywhere he wants. I'm not saying I'm restricting what he's doing, but you don't have any guarantee that that interaction would be with God if you have one and that he, he's really there. But you can have assurance that he's really there in these places because he's specifically promised to be present. And this is one of the ways that. He sustains his church and spreads gospel. Okay, um, so that one, your your question is good in that we make the distinction about the public exercise of this. Um, so that's why we don't have a different person come up with the absolution of the congregation. Which, if we didn't think it was specifically carried out through that, we probably would. All right, so your question kind of answered the next couple. Bottom got just a few minutes. Um, let's look at the qualifications and process to become a pastor. So open up your Bibles to First Timothy 3, 1 to 2, and we also have Titus 1, 5 to 9. And just to clarify, sometimes in the scriptures, when it uses the word elder, 
it's not using that word in the sense that we know it, but it's using it in the sense of the office of pastor. So Titus 1, it's talking about those who hold the office of pastor. It's not talking about elders as we know. Um, so elder as we know it kind of developed later as a separate like deacon office, um, kind of outside of the office of the pastor. Biblically, it's, it's used to refer to. All right, so I'm going to read the first Timothy 3 one for us. The saying is trustworthy. And if anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. All right, so uh, it just all those are pretty self explanatory except for the above reproach part. The above reproach part does not mean perfect, but it means that they are able to carry out the task given to them in the context of their call. So let's say five years from now, you guys discover that I'm an alcoholic. Not, but let's say you do. Right? It could be that at this particular place, that would lead me to no longer be able to hold the office. But there have been places where pastors have confessed that to their congregation. And the congregation forgave them, recognizing that they're just a sinner to call to an office, and they were able to continue carrying out the office. So the above reproach part is uh, is for moral failures that invalidate the the person's ability to carry out the office in that place. Right. So you're probably not going to hear any teachings from me about marriage if I've publicly committed adultery and divorced my wife. Right. So that would invalidate you from the office. That's that's what that above reproach part. It doesn't mean you're a, a way better person than everybody else and, and that, that you, you do all the right things. Does that make sense? Okay, and now let's look at the first, uh, at Titus 1, 5 to 9. Somebody have that one? Yeah. Okay. This, is, this is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above approach, reproach, Husband of one wife, whose children are schoolers and not over the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer is God's steward who must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick tempered, or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, not both good, self controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy words taught, so that he may give the good instruction and sound doctrine, and also to be truthful. All right, thank you. So um, all of that stuff goes into the selection of candidates in our center. So when you apply to the center initially, you've got to do a couple interviews and they, they ask you about all that stuff. If you have things in your past that may disqualify you, they'll find those things. Um, and there's usually, uh, you have to get, obviously there's not a like, if this happened, you can never become a pastor. They, they delve into the specifics and all of that. Um, but just for example, let's say you're like Paul, where before you became Paul and you were Saul, you did unspeakable, horrible things. So how was Paul able to become sent by Jesus? Well, he, he, once he became a believer, he turned away from all of those things, right? And it took him some time to get past the perception, right? Even the first guy that, that Jesus sends to him and says, I have plans for him. He's like, yeah, but this guy was the guy that... You, don't you know God? He was like killing people who were talking about you. Uh, so there, but that process is pretty rigorous. Uh, usually through the course of the seminary, if it's not something you feel called to, they usually, I knew a fair number of people that dropped out over the course, not because they couldn't do the work, but because they felt that this wasn't really the calling for them. You do field work, so you do some of the work at churches under the supervision of an ordained pastor. And sometimes guys find out then, they start doing some of that work and like, I'm not really well suited for this. Turns out I just wanted to study theology, so I'm, I'm not going to pursue this. Um, so that happens fairly often. Um, so it's a, it's a process, and that's why when you're looking for a pastor, you contact a district within the Senate because you're trusting that their process has called qualified people. Okay? Now, the Senate, like any individual congregation, is full of a bunch of sinners, so sometimes things don't work out the way that God intends them. The pastors succumb to sin or 
Um, they they go through occasionally. I think there are probably some people who go through with wrong ideas and all that kind of stuff. So it's not a perfect system, but this is this is treated seriously so that when you do call a pastor, you can make certain assumptions about their character and like they've been vouched for publicly by multiple things. Yeah, I add to that. So yeah, it's been so fresh. Yeah. <laughs> um, your your life is laid out like an open book. It is probably one of the most humbling things to go through. Um, not only was I drilled and interrogated with service ministry, um, our marriage was was laid open for, for consumption to see where we are uh, in our walk. Um, there was a you know, criminal investigation. There is. Uh, you know, financial investigation, your whole life is, is delved into. Uh, they know exactly who they're getting before they, they, they go yeah. Yeah. Because uh, while it does say they desire a noble task and they pursue the office of overseer, it also says that the, the, the public teaching and preaching is not for everyone because they are held to a higher standard. So, uh, you know, because a lot more harm can be done through those things than, than, than others. Yeah. Did you, have, did you have to take a psych evaluation? Uh, they, I did. Yeah, they do a well. They they don't do a. Uh, I don't know if it's like a formal evaluation, but they do have trained people come in and, and talk to you. And I mean, if you have a history of mental illness or you've gone, you've taken drugs for those sorts of things. I mean, they'll know all that and all that. And if you on your, you go on your vicarage, your third year at the seminary, so seminary's four years. Two years of study at the center, your third year is an internship called Vicarage, where you're sent to a congregation for a year under the supervision of an ordained pastor supervisor, and you do the work that they've assigned you there um, that's pertaining to the office. And sometimes, as a result of that, the supervising pastor will say that they don't recommend you because you don't have the, the stuff that you need to, to effectively carry out the office. So, um, so there's a, I, all that to say that there's a long process of evaluation through these standards before the name appears on a list that you're trying to call to be a pastor. Uh, and that's part of this exercise in this and the way that they do this. Because it's a serious responsibility. Um, and it's one that's, that Christ seems to give very specific instructions for, and so we want to honor his intention. All right. That will, I, I figured we probably wouldn't get through both Office of the Keys of Confession, um, but it ended quite at the next spot. Um, so we don't meet next week because we are going to be uh, crying and laughing and stuffing our faces as Keith and Vanessa are doing their farewell. Um, but so we have Ruth for two weeks from now. So read the book of Ruth. Maybe, maybe if you're ambitious, read it a couple of times. Um, and become familiar with it, come with ideas and questions and thoughts, and then we'll pick up the confession and we'll start into communion um, two weeks as well, this afternoon. All right? Okay, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.